Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this Community Near Fault Observatory breakout session on rupture dynamics and earthquake source processes. Properties, sorry. I am Casey Adderhold, Project Associate at Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. IRIS is committed to fostering the exchange of scientific ideas by providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment. All participants are expected to abide by the IRIS meeting code of conduct. Geophysical data collected within rupture zones of significant earthquakes are essential for testing and developing further models of earthquake processes. Focusing on in situ observations in the immediate vicinity of fault zones where rocks suffer permanent deformation during faulting events could transform the understanding of earthquake physics, improve ground motion prediction estimates, and contribute to structural engineering efforts to mitigate earthquake impacts. This breakout session is one in a series of sessions intended to gather input from the broader earthquake science community on key research areas, science questions, and the data and experiments needed to address them in the near fault zone. This breakout session will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Sciences Science Presentations YouTube channel, and the discussion held here today will inform future sessions, workshops, and proposals. Should you have a comment or question as the session unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the chat box on your Zoom control panel. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can also raise your hand and we'll call on you in order. At the appropriate times, we'll read your name and question to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, we may combine or skip them. If the session happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, we will reboot it. Just click the Zoom link again. And automatic captions are available to be turned on and off on your Zoom control panel. To get an idea of the group we have with us today, I'm going to launch a quick poll. Please select your career stage and the type of institution you are currently employed or enrolled in, as well as your prior familiarity and interest in the Community Near Fault Observatory. This poll will remain open and we can share the results at the end of the session. I'm going to pass this now to Daniel and Ava to present an introduction and then moderate the rest of this session. All right, great, let's see. Thanks, Casey, um, and thanks everyone for showing up today um, for our fourth breakout session related to this Near Fault Observatory project. Um, the focus today is going to be on what we can learn about rupture dynamics and earthquake source processes um, from a near fault observatory. So um, today, uh, myself, so I'm, I'm Daniel Trugman, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, and Ahmed Albana, who's at University of Illinois. Um, are going to try to moderate this session. Um, and so the basic plan is we're going to have two speakers, um, Alice Gabriel from Scripps Institution of Oceanography and UCSD, and David Shelley, um, who's at the US Geological Survey. Um, and so after their talk, they're going to have we're going to have some time for questions related to their talks, but we're also going to have a long period at the end of the session um, where we can discuss you know various topics that come up today. Um, and our focus is really on trying to um, really get at what a community near fault observatory could do um, for our understanding of the physics of earthquakes, um, both from the observational and from the modeling perspective and kind of the synergies between observations and modeling. And we really want to focus on the importance of near fault data because that's what's really new about this project. Um, so I'm just going to present a few slides just to uh, motivate the session. Um, and so the first thing we want to think about are what are the key science questions that a near fault observatory could answer. Um, and so there's kind of various timescales that we could get some new information. Um, before a major rupture, we could get some information about nucleation processes, um, how earthquakes get started, um, source and rupture characterization of the smaller earthquakes. So not the kind of the system spanning events, but some of the smaller earthquakes that will occur more frequently. Um, if we do happen to catch a larger earthquake, then we could learn a lot about the kinematics and dynamics of those ruptures and also about some of the processes that are really only um, available to see in the near field. So things like inelastic deformation, um, some types of isotropic and volumetric source effects that only are visible at high frequencies, and also learn things like you know, fluid processes, the effects of nonplanar geometry, and really get a handle on the earthquake energy budget. Uh, and then, of course, after a rupture, we can get a better study of post seismic processes and also earthquake triggering and how we kind of transition between phases of the earthquake cycle. Um, and so those are kind of the overarching science questions we might want to think about. 
Um, but the observatory is really there to help us capture some of the signals that could inform those science questions. And those signals are going to come in, you know, many different flavors, many different types, um, all the way from the detection of small earthquakes, um, you know, detection of some um, transients in the geodetic time series, um, source characterization, so the characterization of the, some of the smaller earthquakes that are occurring in the inner seismic period, and also some of the larger earthquakes that we might be able to capture their actual rupture process as it goes along. Um, we can measure um, strain, we can measure a bunch of different types of geodetic data sets, um, and we also um, focused on imagery data sets, how they might be able to inform us on um, various earthquake processes throughout the entire seismic cycle. Um, and so we also want to think about what aspects of an observatory are really necessary to recover those signals. And so we're planning on, you know, instrumenting with a broad range of instruments. So that would include broadband sensors, that would include strong motion sensors, um, sensors that are um, geodetic. Um, we've talked a lot about imagery data sets over the past few weeks. Um, you know, there's a potential for doing post-event response. Um, and there's also, you know, these types of exotic data sets that aren't really in the toolkit of most seismologists that maybe still um, have a lot of information value for this type of projects. And we, so we want to think about a little bit outside the box and consider things like thermal data sets and ENM, chemical, acoustics. So the types of stuff that might not be in your current toolkit, but might be actually interesting um, for this observatory. Um, and so the last aspect that we want to touch on um, is that, you know, we've talked about all these different types of data sets They come from many different fields. And so if we really want to understand them holistically, that's going to be a pretty broad community effort. Um, the data types is going to be large in volume and also large in its diversity. Um, and so this is really a, an interesting opportunity um, for um, education and outreach for professional development for developing these really big multi-scale and multidisciplinary projects. And so we want to think about how we could use this observatory as a catalyst to really um, expand its societal impact. Um, and so I don't want to talk too much more about this. We have some great speakers lined up. So we're going to start with Alice's presentation and then move on to David Shelley. Um, we'll have time for questions for both of those presentations, and then we'll circle back at the end with a community discussion where we can discuss, you know, the, the stuff that we've learned from Alice and David, but also some of these um, other um, aspects of the observatory that might be of interest. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to pass it to um, Ahmed, and he can introduce our speakers um, more formally. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for, for the slides, and we would love to hear from all of you in the discussion session on all these ideas. So as Daniel mentioned, we have two speaker, two great speakers lined up today. The first speaker is Elise Gabriel. So Elise doesn't need much introduction, so I will keep it brief. Uh, Elise is currently a faculty at University of California, San Diego. Her research is at the intersection of high performance computing, computation physics, and seismology, and her work has already been groundbreaking in the area of large-scale simulations of earthquakes, ground motion, and tsunamis. And we are very excited to have her speak today to talk about multi-scale modeling of earthquake uh, physics in the near and far field. So Elise, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ahmed. <clears throat> Okay, I, I think I changed my title, so um, I will read it out again. So, multi scale observations and 3D earthquake rupture dynamics modeling. And I added this kind of discussion uh, provoking subtitle uh, from confrontation to integration. <clears throat> and of course, I will uh, show you a lot of nice examples where integration of multi scale observations and rupture dynamics modeling um, synergize and uh, lead to new insight. And that's uh, my whole uh, pitch for this talk. Um, what I have on the title slide is one of the first rupture dynamics models from uh, 1989, um, where you see here is a 2D dynamic rupture rate and state fault simulation, already showing a lot of interesting nonlinear complexity. In the middle panel, you see one of the tools we're using to do this kind of models nowadays. So that is the most scenic one, I guess I could find. That's the Mare Nostrum supercomputer in Barcelona house, uh, housed in a former chapel. And on the animation that's playing on the, um, on the right, is um, one um, dynamic rupture model that's actually used um, a lot of observations of the 2016 Kalkoa New Zealand earthquake to um, try and answer some of the riddles that that multi-fault segmented mixed faulting mechanism earthquake posed to us. 
So the get started dynamic rupture modeling in general is um, a physics-based way to understand earthquake um, nucleation propagation and arrest of single um, earthquake scenarios um, in most of the cases that I will talk about today. And we saw for spontaneous dynamic earthquake rupture as the nonlinear interaction of frictional failures and kind of friction law and seismic wave propagation. And um, we had a lot of progress using simple models and also um, linear elastic fracture mechanics. Um, and what we're seeing there is that using these simplified models um, that we can generate a whole zoo of earthquakes, a whole zoo of different physics that could govern um, earthquake rupture. Um, and that would lead to, for example, very slow or faster ruptures, um, sub shear, sub Rayleigh speeds, or super shear ruptures, to earthquakes taking the shapes of uh, pulses or of cracks with uh, differences in their rise time. Um, we could also see interesting effects like slip reactivation being explained in these simple models. And we can spin up a whole phase diagram. For example, thinking about relative fault strength, how much push each of these earthquakes has um, to be started with, um, which would lead us really nicely throughout this um, zoo of rupture styles, for example, decaying pulses, scoring pulses, cracks, sub shear, and super shear. However, and that's kind of the confrontation in nature, and this is not only um, difficult to measure, right? For example, looking at the uh, trying to figure out the difference between pulses or cracks, if you really want like to resolve this. Uh, a uh, small difference in the tail of the um, of the rise time here, um, but also some of these predicted rupture behaviors, for example, super shear rupture speeds are observed much, le much less commonly than we would expect from simple models. If we are um, going to 3D dynamic rupture models, um, one of the advantages of um, facing the challenge of the additional dimension is that we can strive to integrate and interpret um, directly um, the full breadth of geophysical observations and beyond. And how this looks like is that we have at the input side, so what can inform these models, um, things like initial fault stresses or roughness plays um, a role there, for example, or the tectonic loading or coulomb stress changes. Um, geology, so it can mean um, high resolution topography, bathymetry, um, 3D subsurface structure, friction experiments. Of course, there's a huge scale difference um, between these different data sets that we can um, utilize. We put them together in a computational mesh that can be split up over many um, compute cores, any, many ranks that um, solve these problems together and generate um, outputs that again can be verified with different kinds of observations. For example, ground deformation, seismograms, highway GPS um, synthetics, um, of course, everything that happens on the faults in terms of earthquake physics. And it will also um, enable us to link to other communities. There's two examples here that the kind of models, um, the output of these models can be used to understand tsunami generation by linking or fully coupling to tsunami modeling. And here's an example of um, not only the seismic wave field, but also the acoustic boom. Um, and boom is maybe a bit of an overestimate because this is a model of a, mag a local magnitude 1.8 induced earthquake in Helsinki, um, causing some noise disturbance. Um, but it's interesting to, um, for example, link also to the acoustic um, community. <clears throat> now, this is the ideal picture, and I really highly recommend that um, white paper that Nadia Lapusta and uh, many other colleagues put together that, um, is online under this link about the future of modeling earthquake physics. Um, so, I, in an ideal uh, picture, we could link, you know, all of these different fields: seismology, geodesy, mechanics, uh, material science, engineering, um, utilizing the advances that we have in um, each of these fields. However, um, each of these building blocks of physics-based modeling are so interesting or difficult that they're often studied in isolation. And that sometimes leads to non-unique or opposing results similar to data-driven, purely data-driven modeling. And here's just some examples, um, could have put many different um, examples on this slide, but these are you know, the different um, data-driven inferred um, co-seismic models of um, the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. Um, I took this compilation from the work of Wang et al. Um, this is one, um, source model, source inversion allowing for multiple slip rates <clears throat> um, in the inversion at each point of the Toko Oki um, earthquake fault, showing like, this reactivation um, <clears throat> that is difficult to argue with, I guess, purely and a purely data driven approach. And this is a compilation of the um, near trench slip from 45 different slip models, also for Toko showing this huge, um, for Toko showing this huge variation. Now, <clears throat> the proposed way out of this is that we should integrate 
um, observations and models. Um, for example, here is one of such a, another example of such an integrated model um, for the 2004 Sumatra earthquake. But I want to talk about the challenges uh, of doing so. Um, so first of all, as we know, in situ um, earthquake source processes are often ill-constrained and highly nonlinear. So it's very different to, for example, computational seismology, where we often get away by treating our problems in a linear manner. Um, so the question here is how can physics-based models really help us to better understand and also to help us to better observe um, <clears throat> these kind of earthquake source processes. The second challenge, how can we constrain and verify um, physics-based models? Um, specifically, which physical processes and scales are dominant and relevant for understanding the dynamics of real earthquakes? And the third challenge, more of a technical one, but it's important, how to assimilate all of the available, for example, community um, or observatory knowledge um, how to do so in a suitable manner for software and hardware so that we can um, utilize what's available and also for the community. So how can we increase ac accessibility, reproducibility and lowering the barrier of, um, for example, that's posed by these modeling and uh, observational worlds being uh, um, a little bit separated typically. I'm gonna start with one example um, about integrating multi-scale observations and dynamic rupture modeling um, that are two models um, of the CS Valley foreshock and the main shock of the Ridgecrest sequence. So these are two coupled dynamic rupture models incorporating um, upward plasticity, um, topography, as you can see, 3D subsurface velocity structures, and also the co-seismic dynamic and static stress transfers that the main shock would see based on the 6.4 foreshock. <clears throat> and um, we can use data, first of all, for initial conditions. So we need to predefine um, our fault network in these kind of models. This is the um, network that we are using here. It's very similar to the um, SCAC CFM. Um, and we're combining that with a 3D subsurface um, velocity model that we can then also use to constrain this scholastic attenuation. Um, so in these kind of uh, input, uh, a lot of different data sets already um, go in. So inside data, we located seismicity, selected focal mechanisms. <clears throat> Now, all of these faults are in this model exposed to a 3D tectonic stress state. So that could be, sorry, that should be Young and Hauxnitz, which could be one of the SCAC models, um, for example. <clears throat> so in addition to the 3D velocity model, plus we can think about the effect of um, previous large earthquakes and um, can overlay these two, uh, these two um, stress um, initial states to conform the dynamic rupture model. Um, lastly, we have to constrain fault strength. So we talked about geometry, initial loading, and the fault strength. We're doing that by balancing the loading and the fault strength um, <clears throat> to reduce the parameter space. So we're assuming that these faults are apparently weak. So dynamically, they should be weak. And that's in alignment with what we see in laboratory experiments. So we're using severe velocity weakening friction. We also think about poor fluid pressure, <clears throat> um, try to constrain that from observations. Um, and then we can um, really use just a few static calculations. This is very similar to a um, slip tendency analysis in structural um, geology, but balancing always the friction drops or the frictional strength drop with realistic stress drops. Um, so we can, for example, look at the depth dependence of the rate and state friction parameters based on creep meters um, or um, field and lab um, experiments. We can look into the depth of the seismogenic zone by um, um, we look from relocated seismicity and of course we can use the 3d um, stress field to um, tell us something about um, how um, for example the maximum compressive stresses are balancing out favoring either um, strike slip uh, dynamics or you know normal or thrust faulting um, <clears throat> and we also find for the rich per sequence specifically and this is some trial and error involved because we're lacking data um, that we have um, a slight fluid pressure increase between the foreshock and the main shock to be able to reproduce observations. So we have a slightly higher stress drop <clears throat> that, we, um, that we need to pre-parameterize by, uh, by decreasing fluid pressure. Now on the model verification side, we again can use different independent data sets to see um, if the rupture dynamics that we're modeling make sense. So I only show for the briefness of time, uh, for the sake of time, the main shock results here, and I'm not discussing the much, there's a preprint available um, um, at, <clears throat> one of the preprint servers. But um, what we can use are, of course, data-driven um, slip inversions. For example, what I show um, in the middle of this slide is a um, um, probabilistic approach. We can use moment rate or beam, um, our back protection beam powers to look at the time dependence of um, 
of uh, moment release. We can also look into fault surface offset studies and compare them to the model and back projection. <clears throat> We can use um, static GPS and surface displacements, continuous GPS, or of course, um, strong um, motion recordings and compare them with the model to verify that. So keep in mind the synthetics that you're seeing here, they are not based on an inversion. This is a physics-based um, forward model. Um, and we can also look into, for example, surface rupture mapping um, and damage proxy maps and compare them to um, the synthetic off-fault um, distributed deformation that is part of these models in a map view, but also at with depth. Um, this is an outlook, so it's something we haven't applied for Ridgecrest, but we're looking at this at a, at a different scale at the moment. But what's interesting is, of course, also <clears throat> uh, the many fractures that have been mapped um, for the sequence. So this is um, a plot here from um, Xu, where he's mapping um, <clears throat> based on INSA, also the right lateral and the left lateral ruptures. And uh, this is one simulation where we not only have um, a couple of these rate and state friction dynamic rupture surfaces, but 900. This is one main fault embedded in um, fractures that are more tightly packed than you see in this exploded view. They look more like something like this. And each of them follows rate and state friction. And each of them is allowed to dynamically slip and they're interacting with each other. So what you see in the beginning of the simulation is seismicity purely in the damage zone. And all of these um, little fractures are producing smaller um, earthquakes that are triggering each other. And we have some cascading ruptures here. And eventually they trigger a main fault um, that is um, producing, um, and I think in this case, magnitude six event. <laughs> So this is something um, that is possible and that would allow us to make, if you do that on the scale of Ridgecrest to, um, to better understand these kind of observations. Another example, just shortly, so this is what I showed you is basically using physics-based models informed by observations, uh, running the models and then verifying with different independent observations. We can um, also use data-driven uh, slip models directly to inform um, dynamic rupture simulations. Here's one example of a slip model for the Nordshire earthquake, which was kind of controversial. It has two faults that are um, breaking kind of an awkward angle to each other. So one of the questions was, um, is this actually dynamically viable? Can this happen if we are um, applying what we know about earthquake physics in a dynamic rupture model? So what we did um, to do this, we used the same geometry um, as the slip inversion model. So these are two planar faults. To be able to reproduce the um, complexity that you see in the slip inversion, you do need to have um, some heterogeneity in one of the dynamic or more of the dynamic parameters. And you have choices there. You could either think about um, prescribing heterogeneous loading, heterogeneous stress, heterogeneous strength and stress, or heterogeneous dynamic friction. So having basically heterogeneous dynamic stress drop during the simulation. And what we find in this um, exercise is that we can produce several families of models with spatially heterogeneous dynamic parameters, allowing us to retrieve the image slip distributions um, equally well. <clears throat> so this is just one of these models which has heterogeneous strength of the fault and heterogeneous stress based on the, um, the slip model. And um, using this family of models, we can have um, a satisfactory fit. If it's not an inversion directly with geodetic and strong ground motion um, observations. So again, this is a comparison here. <clears throat> um, However, you know, if you have assume heterogeneity in any of these um, dynamic parameters can have quite different implications, for example, for stress drop or for um, earthquake physics um, in general and um, the ge geology that governs um, rupture at depth. So if you're looking at, for example, at geological inferences in Nordia, um, we see that there is um, quite high um, static um, higher values of um, um, of friction, frictional strength in located in areas where we also infer a small slip and low um, energy nucleation, um, whereas we have um, <clears throat> maybe different um, rock properties in the areas where we have this large slip patch. So this would actually point towards um, our model C, where we have heterogeneous dynamic friction, um, more realistic if we also include geological inferences. So that can help us to um, better distinguish between um, these different models. <laughs> so more physics doesn't always mean more models, but it can actually reduce them, um, um, the model space. If you do that in even a little bit uh, more systematically, we can think about not inverting for um, a slip picture um, that happened during earthquake rupture, but inverting directly for the dynamic parameters. And that's what we did um, here for the Amatrice earthquake. So this is a Bayesian dynamic rupture source inversion using strong count motion data up to, um, up to one hertz. Um, and this is the preferred slip model here. This is the animation of the slip rate. And these are some of the parameters we're inverting for. <clears throat> um, 
we have a couple of simplifications to be able to make this model uh, feasible. However, we need to visit a million um, dynamic rupture models to come up with the ensemble solution and to find the preferred models. And since these are so many, we are basically restricted to do this um, up to one hertz. Now, one idea is, okay, we have the best smooth model, the one hertz model. We know what you need to generate um, realistic high frequency synthetics from um, using dynamic rupture simulations. We know that we need things like fault roughness. So why don't we just um, enhance our best model with these physics-based ingredients to be able to get broadband um, synthetics in a fully physics-based way? And there's a um, study where we've been doing that and we found that we don't only have to add, for example, fault roughness um, to get realistic um, synthetics. We also have to add topography and able to um, elongate um, the synthetics in a more realistic way. And we also see that it's, um, while we have an excellent fit of the velocity waveforms, getting accelerations um, everywhere in the model domain um, correctly um, fitted with these dynamic rupture models is still, um, is still a challenge. It's more challenging than the velocities. Okay, so these high frequency ground motions are amplified early on by fault roughness and topography induced scattering um, prolongs their duration. <clears throat> um, lastly, um, I want to show you an example of how can, uh, how could the fault zone observatory in synergy with rupture dynamics advance our field? So what is shown here is work of Nico Schlieber he presented at the SCAC meeting, where we're adding a flower-shaped fault zone um, to this 3D dynamic rupture models of the Ridgecrest sequence. And this is a flower-shaped fault zone basically consisting of um, reduced um, wave speeds constraints, um, constrained by observations. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see um, the ratio of the model with a fault zone, dynamic rupture model with a fault zone versus without a fault zone. And we're seeing the spectral acceleration um, actually at the period of one second, um, <clears throat> uh, the ratio of um, or what's the difference if we're adding the fault zone. So we're seeing a couple of interesting things here. Uh, one of them is that the fault zone impact is not limited to the direct vicinity of the fault system, but still widely affects ground motions at a distance of more than 50 kilometers to the rupturing faults. We also see that this amplification and deamplification patterns are quite heterogeneous. And also, if I would show you the same picture for different um, periods, um, that would not be the same tendency. So you have different effects. Uh, we could also look at the peak horizontal velocities comparing to um, GMPEs. And what you see on that plot is like all these um, dotted high values are um, coming from the dynamic rupture model. Um, the triangle lines, these are um, the uh, GMPE. So we have higher peak um, horizontal velocities close to the fault. We also see some nice effects of um, the fault zone amplifying um, further um, these kind of um, effects. So I have a summary slide that I also wanted to show you um, another one. So we use supercomputing to do these models, but I want to make the point that we don't need a lot of it to run this fully physics-based models at say to up to one or two hertz. So these are kind of 10,000 CPU hours um, to do these simulations. However, if you go to higher frequencies, um, this increases a lot. So for example, um, we ran on almost all of Frontera this week, um, the same simulation trying to get to 16 hertz or maybe up to 20 hertz. And as you can see, you basically need to go to a, um, um, yeah, a much larger uh, machine to be able to do these kind of simulations. And um, <clears throat> in summary, let me see, I'm looking forward um, to the discussion, of course, and we are on the road to having these huge computers available for us. <clears throat> and um, I'm trying to find my summary slide one second. It's here, that's the one I want to end up. Um, so 3D physics-based dynamic rupture modeling allows us to add mechanic mechanical or dynamically viable insight into the conditions um, and uh, interpretations that are being proposed for um, earthquake physics observations. We can routinely include, unify, and also probe different observational constraints for their dynamic possibility. And if you're doing that on scale of real earthquakes, we would actually reduce the non-uniqueness and help to constrain computing views. And we're also bridging scales between different observables from the lab scale all the way to <clears throat> maybe tsunami or acoustic scale. And the interplay of the ongoing advances in HPC and dense observations will also allow us to do this not only in a scenario-based analysis, but aiming for you know, full multi-physics, um, maybe fully non-linear source path side effects, urgent response, data-driven dynamic inversion, Bayesian UQ, 
and uh, using also ML um, techniques to reduce the amount of forward models or better analyze the forward big data that we're producing. And with this, thanks for listening. And I hope we have a very interesting discussion based on what I said. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Elise, for an excellent talk. Uh, I see Yehuda has his hands up, so please, Yehuda, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi Alice. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I'm just wondering if you could suggest, based on all your work with simulations, what new fault data can have a very big impact on earthquake physics, for example, by allowing us to address some existing paradoxes, allowing us to develop more predictive models, etc. What do you recommend? What should we go after in the near field? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we need more near field data, if you ask me. Um, so that's clear, right? For example, when we're looking at, um, at the synthetics that we're producing in the very near field, we have very little data that we can actually compare to, um, to be able to distinguish between different hypotheses. If it's about how earthquakes start or um, what actually produces high frequency radiation um, versus um, how earthquakes talk to each other. Um, this is, um, you know, we have a lot of kind of big picture constraints, uh, but to really see into the complexities that govern um, these kind of dynamics, uh, that we, we, we need more near field data. And we can, we can, I hope I illustrated, we can produce a lot of output that is Compare that can be comparable to many different kind of observations, but we need a resolution um, to you know to make a meaningful comparison on the scale of the physics that is governing these processes. The scale is small. <clears throat> that's the point. Any any other questions? Quick questions before uh, our next speaker. I think Yangfei had a question in the chat. I don't know, or actually, more questions are showing up in the chat. I don't know if we want to address them now I, or if they're. I common. could also answer them in the chat, and then we discuss more later. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, may, maybe Mohammed, if you would like to ask your question quickly, and we can take that, and then we can move on. I think Yangfei is is more a comment that is uh, for discussion. Uh, uh. Thank you uh, for the time you give me. Uh, thank you, Alice, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have uh, some question. I'm uh, I'm a uh, postdoc uh, researcher and currently work on the seismic wave wave propagation uh, modeling. Uh, could you please uh, describe more uh, on the effect of the uh, faulting mechanism on the rupture mod uh, model you uh, you've made, uh, and uh, if it is uh, available, could you please uh, introduce? <coughs> excuse me. Uh, could you please introduce uh, an offer source uh, report? Uh, such as GitHub, you, you've done on your project, if it is yes. available. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So then the code that we're using or that um, that we used for the things I showed today is um, is open source and we have also documentation and things and it's on GitHub, I will post them. Uh, ah, yeah, thanks. So that's an open source code. Um, for uh, the other questions for the accuracy, so yeah, I could talk a lot about this, but we're using um, a specific numerical algorithm that allows high order accuracy in space and time. But um, you know, this is there's always a trade off of uh, which accuracy you actually need um, with respect also to which geometrical complexity you want to include. So there are certain trade offs of which numerical method is really useful on which scales, on which degree of complexity, which accuracy you you um, you will need. Um, and the last question about the, the faulting mechanisms. So the idea of these um, dynamic rupture models is that uh, it's a numerical experiment. We're not prescribing slip and we're not prescribing the faulting mechanism directly. We are, of course, you have a preferred um, faulting mechanism in the sense of the loading that the fault is experiencing. That you have, depending on like how you load the faults and how the orientation is, you get different ratios of the shear versus the normal loading, and that would favor either strike slip or normal or trust folding. However, 
the experiment itself, the simulation itself is completely spontaneous. So you get um, mixed faulting mechanisms very often if you don't have like a very idealized setup. And um, <clears throat> so that is not something that's prescribed. That is, uh, that is an outcome of the model what kind of faulting mechanism you produce. And an interesting aspect is, for example, this model I showed with the many um, fractures, each of them, you know, slipping at their own um, at their own will. If you look at that from far, this whole model looks like a pure strike slip event. Just because of these fractures, in that case, they were conjugate. And um, you can't you can't basically see that that complexity happening. It just looks like a very ordinary magnitude six track slip event, even if the main fault is not activated. If you have purely diffuse seismicity, um, you look from far <clears throat> and you can't see that. I, I put some more details in the chat. Maybe. Right. Thank, thanks, Alice. So we can move on to our next speaker, uh, David Shelley. So David also needs very little introduction. Doesn't need much introduction. He, um, he's currently a research scientist at USGS Golden, Colorado. He has made significant contributions to our understanding of seismic waveforms and active faulting at different scales and different frequencies, including slow slip and tremors. And today we are pleased to have him uh, give us his perspective on uh, working with data from observatories like the one that's proposed here based on his own experience and what we can learn from far and near field data. So David, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to um, give you some thoughts today. Um, I have to apologize in advance. I'm gonna go through some of the history of observation in part field to give a broader overview of you know, some of the challenges of long-term observation, as well as some of the, you know, exciting discoveries that have been made. But uh, there are many people on this uh, this call who are better qualified to talk about certain aspects of, of this than I am. So, and I don't have time to go over the details. So please accept uh, this in a brief overview. Okay, so here are essentially the overarching points that I want to um, to emphasize today. Um, you know, we know we need long-term observations if we want to can't capture large earthquakes. And, you know, I think we have to recognize that that's a very difficult thing to sustain um, for, for multiple reasons, both from scientific and from kind of funding aspects. Um, what you expect to happen isn't necessarily what will happen. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it can make it hard to plan um, observations, but it also, you know, the flip side is the new data is, is going to bring new discoveries. And um, finally that, you know, we really, ex we really, based on part field, we see interesting and interconnected processes happening both over a broad range of depths and over a broad range of timescales. And I think, you know, if we can design a, um, an observatory to capture, you know, those ranges as best we can, you know, that's going to give us the most likelihood of success. Okay, so again, this is a brief history. Um, the Parkfield prediction experiment. So, you know, some of you will know this was before my time, but um, Bakken and Lynn published a paper in 1985, you know, arguing for this park field prediction um, experiment. And, you know, their premise was that based on the, you know, the semi-regular history of magnitude six earthquakes in the park field area that, you know, that they expected the next magnitude six to occur before 1993. So this was kind of a, um, you know, a tractable timescale. They were saying that here's a place where we expect a magnitude six within the next eight years. So this is tractable both on scientific and, um, you know, kind of funding time scales. But, you know, of course, we know that um, that earthquake didn't happen by 1993. And in fact, you know, by um, the early 2000s, you know, I think a lot of people were beginning to wonder, you know, well, is this earthquake going to happen? And what I think there was, um, difficulty in, you know, even justifying the continued experiment, or at least some questions um, about whether, 
we should continue to invest resources to capture this earthquake. Um, and fortunately, um, fortunately, we did continue to invest resources, and that earthquake happened in 2004. So, you know, based on that original model, this was 16 years late. I put late in quotation marks because, you know, of course, the earthquake comes when it comes. Um, this was considered, uh, at least in many ways, the best recorded earthquake in history. Um, we learned a lot from this earthquake. Uh, unlike the 1934 and 1966 earthquakes, we did not see foreshocks or other short-term precursors. Um, but the co-seismic rupture and the post-seismic deformation were recorded in, in rich detail. Um, among the surprises was the rupture direction was opposite from you know, sort of the widely anticipated direction. So it ruptured from the south to the north instead of instead of the other way around. Okay, and we also had the SAFOD project, which was actually going on, started before the, the 2004 earthquake. Um, this was part of the Earthscope um, initiative, you know, with the goal to directly sample the San Andreas Fault at three kilometers depth. Um, so this was near the source of some repeating earthquakes. And the goal was also that this would serve as a long-term observatory within the fault. So major discoveries from SAFOD included, um, you know, returning core from, from the fault zone itself, which I know has been, you know, analyzed extensively in laboratory experiments, um, and identifying uh, multiple active fault strands um, based on borehole deformation just during the, the few years that that borehole was being monitored. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about um, a little bit of my own, you know, experience in working with data from the Parkfield area, in particular looking at, you know, this really interesting tremor and low frequency earthquake source that we see within the lower crust of the San Andreas. And, you know, even though our, our resolution is still limited, we can see a lot that we couldn't see before we started looking at these signals with respect to the, it's one of the few, you know, semi-direct ways we have to see what's happening in the lower crust. And I think we can also expect that there are interactions between, you know, what the fault's doing in the lower crust and what it's doing in the upper crust. So Tremor was first discovered on the, under the San Andreas. Uh, there's a paper by Nadeau and DeLink published in 2005 um, showing this zone near Shalam. Um, Tremor sort of concentrated in this small zone here, just up to the north is the Parkfield High Resolution Seismic Network, which is the borehole seismic network that was primarily used to detect um, these tremor activities. So I started working on tremor around Parkfield um, a couple of years later and you know, started looking at it from, an earth, from a low frequency earthquake standpoint. So we had um, identified low frequency earthquakes making up this tremor, essentially um, repeating low frequency earthquakes, this swarm of low frequency earthquakes um, kind of overlapping, making up this tremor signal. So from this work, we were able to identify, you know, a much broader distribution of tremor activity extending along almost 150 kilometers of the fault um, from the Southeast um, up to, um, well, Northeast, sorry, Northwest of Parkfield. Um, and, you know, over time, we've been able to develop a now more than 20 year catalog of tremor activity along the San Andreas Fault. We've done more than 50 trillion cross correlation measurements to detect all of these um, activity and all these different sources. I should say that each source has a waveform template that we use to detect further activity with that source. Uh, we've detected well over a million low frequency earthquake events um, since 2001. And, you know, in contrast to the, you know, magnitude seven earthquake time scale that, you know, is many decades to perhaps centuries, we see detectable tremor and low frequency earthquake activity beneath this part of the San Andreas um, every day. Uh, and this catalog is available for download if anybody wants to play with it. And one thing you'll notice from this lower plot here is showing the amplitude that we observe for a tremor activity. We're really just detecting 
Uh, we're detecting all of this tremor activity at these little black triangles. These are, again, the part field high resolution seismic network borehole stations. And we're really only able to detect tremor a certain distance from these really low noise stations. Um, so things kind of peter out on this plot to the north and to the south, but we don't really have a good idea, especially to the south, the station density gets so low that it's very difficult to um, detect and characterize tremor in that region. So it would be really interesting to have a better sense of what you know, how, how much farther to the south does this tremor activity extend? What are the details of its activity and so forth? So among the, the really interesting properties of tremor and low-frequency earthquakes, things that it's telling us about um, the lower crustal fault that we really didn't know before is it's very sensitive to very small stress perturbations, both static and dynamic. So I'll just quickly show a few examples, um, sensitivity to the tides, sensitivity to nearby earthquakes, as well as sensitivity to distant earthquakes. Okay, so first of all, the tides. This is from a paper by Amanda Thomas uh, from several years ago. This um, top plot is a cross section showing the 88 different low frequency earthquake sources. And the essentially the points here are color coded by how sensitive they are to this right lateral shear stress. And you can see overall um, tremor and low frequency earthquakes are very sensitive. The red dots here are, there's 50% more events um, during times of encouraging right lateral shear stress than you would expect otherwise. Um, but that sensitivity to tides really varies a lot depending on location. We see a pretty low sensitivity for these shallower sources um, and kind of a moderate sensitivity for, um, for most of the rest of the sources. And in fact, you know, this is one of the, the pieces of evidence that you know, was arguing that these are events that are reflecting right lateral shear stress because um, if you estimate the optimal direction of slip, you know, assuming some low coefficient of friction that we think are probably relevant for this part of the fault, the optimal directions align pretty closely with this, um, with the fault direction and with the expected slip direction. Okay, so we also see extreme sensitivity to small stresses from nearby earthquakes. So this is an example from uh, the 2003 San Simeon earthquake. So this um, box here is a, you know, a rough source zone um, for that earthquake. The plot on the lower left here is showing um, the activity rate in each of the different low frequency earthquake families um, before and after the San Simeon earthquake. So what, what we'll notice if, if we model the, the Coulomb stress from this earthquake, this earthquake is actually causing a negative um, Coulomb stress to the north of Parkfield. Um, so this is essentially a stress shadow. And what we see is that tremor activity in this area, which is the, the blue lines here in the lower left, it shuts off almost completely for about a month before it starts up again. So that is the, the stress change from the San Simeon earthquake cast this stress shadow that took about a month for the background tectonic loading to, to overcome. So with the, the 2004 Parkfield earthquake, the effects were even greater, as you might imagine, um, given the proximity of this earthquake. So here, if you focus on the cross section, you know, of course, there's very large stress changes right around um, the 2004 rupture, and they decay as you get farther away. But essentially, the, the low frequency earthquake sources closest to the rupture had a very large response um, and activity many, many times what they were um, before the earthquake. And this is giving us some information about the post-seismic stress transient and the post-seismic slip, post-seismic relaxation being accommodated by after slip in the lower crest. And this is information we can get in a gross sense from geodetic modeling, but you know, as we know, the resolution from surface geodesy decreases with depth. So this is a way to recover some of that resolution at depth. 
And finally, we see a lot of sensitivity to um, dynamic stresses from distant earthquakes. This is just one particular example um, from the 2010 magnitude 8.8 earthquake in Chile. We see triggering from a lot of earthquakes that are much smaller than this. But this is one particular example where, you know, not only triggering low frequency earthquakes during the dynamic waves, um, during the largest dynamic waves, essentially the largest dynamic waves set off this uh, migrating sequence of activity that continues even after those largest waves have passed. Okay, so some of the implications. Well, as I mentioned before, Tremor gives us a tool to examine deformation in the lower crest. And we can really expect that uh, there are interactions between earthquakes um, that are going to happen or have already happened in the upper crust and this lower crustal deformation. Uh, tremor migration patterns, which I didn't um, talk about, but there's a few examples here on the right. It suggests that there's a through-going but complex fault structure in the lower crust. You know, maybe that's not so much different than the fault structure in the upper crust. Um, tremor suggests that lower crustal fault is extremely weak with a very low friction coefficient. Um, and maximum tremor amplitudes do vary substantially as a function of space. And we don't really understand what controls that. You know, like I said, we sort of see activity petering out at the, you know, as we get farther from park field, but in part that's a that's an observational effect. So if we had a whole bunch of new observations, if we had new stations to the south of Parkfield, what else would we discover? We, we don't know until we put those stations in. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears again here um, and talk about you know, what I think are some of the lessons from Parkfield for a potential community near fault observatory. So it's true that, uh, Near fault observations are important, they're underrepresentative, but I think we have to keep in mind that, you know, we can't do everything with just near fault observations and we have to look at things perhaps in a little bit broader context. Um, so one problem with uh, near fault observations is that faults, as we know, fault zones are messy and uh, seismic waves that travel through these messy structures you know, get distorted. And this is, you know, a great thing if we want to look at this structure, but it's a problem if we're trying to look at um, seismic sources that um, occur below, you know, below this complexity. So I put this up, this example, this is an example showing um, in this left-hand plot, these little dots are different seismic arrays that were installed near the fault, um, near park field. And you can see that each um, array kind of has its own unique response. And part of this is because of the complexity in the fault zone, particularly this plot here in the lower right shows essentially what looks like two different sources coming from either side of the fault. And what's probably happening here is the low velocity, you know, essentially the seismic waves are traveling around some of this low velocity complexity within the fault and makes it look almost like you have two um, tremor zones coming from either side of the fault. Um, so these are, these are you know, things we have to keep in mind if we're trying to look at, at seismic sources. Okay, so fault zones are messy. Uh, you know, if we're looking directly above a vertical strike slip earthquake, that's you know, nodal for both P and S waves. Um, we know that earthquake locations and focal mechanisms are, are best constrained with the data from a range of azimuths and distances. And site selection is really key. Anyone who's ever looked at seismograms know that the best seismic stations are much, much better than the worst seismic stations. And a lot of that um, depends on what kind of site that they're installed on. And sometimes those sites, um, you know, you, you don't really want a site that has complex geology underneath if you want to get a clean recording. And finally, if we want to observe the fault over its full depth range, including down into the lower crust, um, we'll do best with instruments at a range of distances. 
And sometimes, you know, we may be able to rely on existing networks for these more distant stations, stations, but in other cases, you know, I think we need to look at, you know, potentially augmenting um, observations at, you know, what you might consider intermediate distances. Okay, so closing thoughts. Uh, in my opinion, the most difficult part of maintaining a long-term observatory is the long-term part. Um, it's hard to, everybody's excited about a new project and starting a new project, but it's hard to maintain that excitement um, over the long term. And if we're trying to capture magnitude seven earthquakes, you know, we really need to think long term. Um, so if we can establish an observatory that captures, you know, ongoing processes happening at a range of depths, then I think that will help maintain interest um, and help sustain this kind of effort long term. And you know, perhaps as evidence of that, you know, Parkfield, we've learned a ton from Parkfield. Um, but I still have the sense that Parkfield has lost a bit of its luster recently. Even though, you know, we're now 18 years since the last magnitude six earthquake, perhaps uh, you know, we're getting closer to the next magnitude six earthquake and maybe even the next magnitude um seven to eight, you know, Fort Tejon type earthquake. So if we want to prove that we can sustain a fault observatory long term, you know, perhaps one component of that should be um, considering reinvesting in Parkfield. And that's all I have. I'm happy to um, take questions or, um, you know, looking forward to discussion. Thank, thanks, David. Great talk. And I, I really like you are bringing up these uh, points because I think that's what we would love to discuss more and think about because these are the challenges that we will face if if we are moving forward with this. Um, so Alice, do you have a question you'd like to ask David? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I was wondering, um, you know, one of the uh, one of the things I would think would be great is have having something like a simulated model. So that goes more in the direction of, you know, I don't know if you follow this, but there's at least in Europe, there's a big push towards digital twins. So you have on continuous integration of observations with models. Um, so what what would you say? What would you say? How is that something that you thought about in the or that the Parkfield community thought about? Or is there always this kind of has there been a disconnect between models and observations or what what do you think how would you see the the integration between maybe modeling and um observations in the in that project <clears throat> yeah I, i'm not sure i can speak directly to that because i'm not a modeler you may have uh ideas yourself but you know i know there certainly have been um people have been doing models of the parkfield ruptures and of that area for a long time um, but I'm not the best one to speak to those. Maybe there's someone else in this group who would like to. Yehuda, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. I, um, great talk, David. I, I agree that the wave propagation, everything in the fault zone environment is messy, not just the wave propagation, right? So I'm, I'm just asking you, don't you think this messy wave propagation in the fault zone also reflects or influences complex, detailed physics in the fault zone, which is lost? It's related to other comments, it's lost when you are far from the field, and in fact limits our ability with this loss of information, the models that we have are less predictive. We don't have sufficiently predictive model. I agree with your statement and Peter Shirar uh, seconded it that we need off fault sensor to see cleaner pictures. But again, this I agree fully. These cleaner pictures don't have, they are cleaner because they don't have all the detailed uh, fluctuations that might be observed, you know, within the fault zone. We actually need both. In my yes. view, I mean, we I... have off fault sensors. What we miss is the understanding of the local processes within this volumetric fault zone. It's not a surface. Um, and yeah, it's going to be very challenging. And I fully agree with you. The biggest challenge is to plan something that will be sustainable for at least for several decades, because that's what it would take. 
But if we do that and observe all the messiness and then develop better models uh, that are not associated with just the surfaces, but fault zones with all of this, I think we'll get uh, more predictive models. Yeah, so I absolutely agree that we need both. Um, you know, if we want to be able to see the messiness, but when there are opportunities, we want to see the, the messy view and the clean view if there is one, yeah. um, because I think a lot can be gained from that comparison um, as well. So there, there are cases where, you know, like I said, the, you know, the background network may be sufficient at that sort of intermediate distance, but I think there are cases where it's, where it's lacking. Right. The design, the design should incorporate. Absolutely. We need this multi-scale. Uh, I, I just want to say, if we go after two faults, San Jacinto and San Andreas, for example, the array on the San Jacinto will give us far field view of what's happening on the San Andreas and vice versa. Uh, also, we have some regional arrays, 2D arrays, but we need to augment. I mean, I, I, there's no, no, you know, question is, so Martin might put a comment there about, you know, if we have $30 million, you know, what do we do? That's the question. What do we do with a limited uh, budget? Yeah. Where, where, where are the biggest holes right now, most crucial holes in, in data acquisition that can really have big impact on developing next generation earthquake models? That's so so, so I, I think this is a great leeway for, for the general discussion. And I think Mar Martin and Peter can, can actually also maybe voice their opinions uh, live in, in this session. So uh, I will hand it to Daniel, who could just put the slide for sure. uh, wrapping up the discussion. Thanks again, David, for a great talk. And then maybe Martin and, and Peter can go ahead and, and share their opinions. Yeah, so this is just to kind of remind people of the, the you know, <laughs> framework for this discussion, and then we can let it go from there. But you know, we're, we've talked a lot about some of the key science questions um, and also about, you know, what are the signals that the observatory could record? And then I think what's been really nice for the past maybe 10 minutes or so, we're really getting into the details of the of the observatory itself in terms of like what types of sensors do we want? What what geometry of sensors? And there may not be, you know, one one answer. I mean, you could imagine that, you know, in different areas, different parts of the fault might have you know, the action at different depths, and you might need arrays of different apertures, depending on the fault zone depth. So, um, so these are all things that we can discuss kind of more generally, but so we're just focused on kind of maybe these four points on science questions, signals related to the science questions, the details of the observatory itself, and then the last part, um, that might actually speak to what David was talking about. How do we sustain momentum for the observatory? I think that could in part be done um, if we have kind of a much stronger, you know, educational or community engagement aspect of the observatory, that would really sustain the momentum in some way. And so that's something that we could discuss as well. So those are just reminders of what, what we can discuss with, over the remaining time. But I think we, we want to let this be a little bit free form. So. Yeah, so. Um, Peter, perhaps you can go ahead and uh, share your comments, please. Uh, sure. I've said them, something in the chat, and it's uh, mainly to support um, um, David as to um, the importance of the off fault. I mean, it's still um, near fault, I think, <laughs> can call it that, but it's, you know, um, five um, uh, um, or ten. Uh, um, um, or 15 uh, kilometers away and you know it would be important to select uh, clean uh, uh, geologic sites and you know these are areas where I think we'll get the best view of what's um, going on at what I would call uh, 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 seismogenic uh, uh, depths of uh, um, 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 uh, 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 more than top five kilometers where earthquakes are uh, um, uh, nucleating. And although I agree that, you know, certainly the, the fault zone itself is uh, important for uh, hot rupture dynamics, I think a lot of that importance is um, occurring at uh, hot depth. And it's hard to see, you know, what's going on at uh, hot 10 kilometers in the fault zone if you're trying to see through 
the strong uh, 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 heterogeneity that's in um, the near surface of the fault zone. So that it is why I think um, it, that it is important. And when I say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a balance, I guess I'm arguing that we shouldn't have a uh, a small number of offsite sensors uh, to complement, you know, what what is um, primarily um, on fault instrumentation. But you know, we should say have uh, 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 um, half of the resources, you know, um, go to things that are off fault. Um, to just put a number, <laughs> you know, out there for discussion. I also uh, think we should consider uh, trying to design uh, um, arrays for this uh, sort of uh, uh, um, small scale arrays, which we could do uh, uh, beam forming and things like that to improve um, the signal to noise. I've worked um, recently with um, Hering Meng and uh, uh, Wen Yan Fan and um, analyzing data from um, a nodal experiment on um, uh, the San Jacinto fault zone, and by applying um, beam forming, you know, we're able to detect um, many, many small earthquakes that aren't even in um, the QTM catalog. So I think uh, you know there's a there's a lot of opportunities there to apply um, new methods, and you know, as um, David was saying, we won't know what we're going to find out um, <clears throat> um, on the, um, until we put the instrumentation out. Thanks, thanks Peter. Yeah, we've got a lot of great comments in the chat, but I guess Alice just raised her hand, so maybe she can, she can jump in. Yes, now. I was just trying to, I mean, Mm, agree with Ahmed, what he also put in the in the chat. So from I, I think you, the discussion is um, is agreeing, right? That we need both. And just maybe to highlight why we would be interested in the in the very near field. Um, we know it's messy, but we, we're using um, at the moment experiments from really from scales that we know that they're they are off, and there's really some fundamental um, discussions or fundamental um, questions that are open on how to actually scale rock friction experiments to the um, the real earthquake um sizes so we do that but we actually really miss the data to verify or falsify for example if fracture energy is scale dependent or not and so and this is this is such a fundamental question that governs everything you know from nucleation towards the seismic cycle um towards how faults interact how big distances an earthquake could dynamically bridge you know how about the maximum magnitude these are questions that feed directly into into hazard assessment right it, it seems fundamental but these are you know the length scales that we that we assuming based on um, scaling up laboratory experiments on the centimeter scale, the meter scale that are inherently too simple, that they're you know not including any of the actual complexity and parameters of the se at seismogenic depth. So if you could do, um, if you can get even a single data point that is helping us there, that would be a, that would be a big um, a big advancement. And then earthquakes are dynamic, you know, they're not static, staying where they should stay to move fast to see them, and that um, yeah, um, would argue for you know having some kind of opportunity to observe what happens dynamically to smaller scales because we're using things that are really coming from observations that are not on the same scales as earthquakes operating on great maybe uh maybe bell can jump in yeah let me i had a couple of things i wanted to add here i, I agree with what alice is saying one of my concerns is that everything we've talked about at this point is at the surface. And we're still five to 10 to kilometers away from the zone that we're interested in studying. We have to recognize that. So being on top of the fault and being a few kilometers on the fault really doesn't matter in terms of that nonlinear zone, unless you're particularly interested in what happens in the upper kilometer. Maybe we are. But, but to speak to the kind of the nature of the observatory, I'd, I'd like to suggest that, um, if we think about the long term, you have to think about what it takes to keep things running over this long period of time. At Parkfield, we unfortunately lost the strain meters. It's some of the strain meters, the strain meter closest to the, to the hypocenter, 
Uh, it was unfortunate. There was, you know, kind of lack of interest and money in maintaining them. It's unfortunate. So it might be worth thinking about what are ways that we can gather dense data uh, efficiently and effectively over a long period of time. I think the DAS revolution is something that we should be paying attention to here. And one model might be to think about a series of parallel fibers that are either on the fault and maybe within a few kilometers of the fault that would give us continuous recording of the wave field and an unaliased wave field, something we don't get from point instruments except with very dense arrays. So I, so I think maybe broadening the ideas about what this, this observatory might look like would be really valuable at this point. Uh, but, but short of going to depth, I think it's going to be difficult to get the information that we're interest, most interested in about the nonlinear processes that actually happen within the rupture zone. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, maybe we can let Steve take one. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm following up on some of the comments that Bill just made and also a comment that I inserted in the chat. And um, Alice, you raised this issue very well in your talk. And that is the importance of constraining in these dynamic rupture models, physics-based rupture models. We really need to understand the physical properties at depth. And this means fluid pressure, frictional properties, involvement of fluids, um, core elastic properties, and actually the structure of the fault zone at depth. So I, I do think it's important in a context of a proposal like this, we were talking about primarily a surface-based series of arrays plus shallow drilling to then say, how can we really test some of these surface-based inferences of physical properties, deformation mechanisms, fluid pressure, stress, friction, et cetera? How can we test those at depth? And I don't see these as mutually exclusive. I think they're actually quite supportive. So um, for the SAFOD project, we spent years and years doing site characterization to pose the project correctly and allow us to extrapolate away from the hole and built on the results from the park field prediction experiment that David Shelley talked about so well. And the same thing could be done here, you know, drilling to test some of these inferences at depth. Yes, it would be expensive, but I think that is one way to maintain the interest in an observatory, which is something else that David mentioned. You know, talk about the surface observation, shallow drilling, it's all important. And then say, could we come back and later and calibrate some of those models with deeper drilling? And that would, of course, require more money and um, continued community enthusiasm. But I do think that these things could be very symbiotic. And the kind of observatory that we're talking about here could then be providing um, strong momentum to do a deeper fault zone drilling projects, such as we had originally proposed back in 1991 when we first proposed drilling to 10 kilometers in the San Andreas. It was a viable idea then, it's still viable. And so I see these as very mutually supportive. Great, thanks. Um, Yehuda has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Just just, just uh, brief, all, all our great comments, just brief replies to several of them. I'll start from Steve. Uh, so and 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 Bill. So uh, Bill and Steve combined. We do have in the plan also a fault parallel as well as fault crossing uh, dust lines. Actually, fault parallel dust lines and fault crossing, not dust, but distributed uh, uh, strain sensors and maybe distributed temperature sensors. We also have in the mix. Uh, one or two uh, shallow boreholes somewhere, maybe three, depending again on budget. So we, it's not deep, uh, but but the, the mixture includes this. And your comments reinforce the need to do this. My final brief comment is, uh, how do we connect all of what we observe at the surface to depth? So one way to connect is we is through development of very detailed structural models of the fault zones. Uh, we're going to get tons of data and we'll be able to develop very high resolution structural models. And then we can take the surface observations through this very detailed structural model with all the messiness of the waves that we observe and, and con connect them to depths. Also through modeling, of course. And finally, uh, there are some surfaces, although you are completely correct, uh, that what we see at the surface is not necessarily what happened at depth. I just want to make two points. One, the so-called clean picture that we think we get on what's happening at depths is related to far field observations. Some of the of this cleanness is just that the high frequency detailed information is gone. Secondly, um, <laughs> I forgot my second point. So, so 
Uh, yeah, so I'll stop. I, I just want to say that some observation at the surface would reflect uh, also processes at depth directly, such as, for example, the, existi the existence, at least qualitatively, if not quantitatively, the existence of volumetric uh, deformation, some very early post seismic uh, signals that you could see right on the fault, uh, variability of uh, the fields. Uh, rupture velocities and slip velocity, etc. So it's, it are not directly what's happening at depth, but they're also not disconnected. And and, and yeah, it's a matter of uh, you know limited budget and, and and how do we spread? Uh, how do we do this uh, in a way that is optimizing the resources? So I know there's no one answer, and all of these comments are very very important. Sorry for the long time. Yeah, <laughs> no, thanks. Um, Daniel, can, can you hear me? I can't raise my hand for some reason. My, my yeah. Zoom didn't allow me. Um, so maybe just to explain briefly my, my comment, any of these bigger experiments will be really expensive. Um, and I have no idea what safe or costed, but if, I'm, I'm just putting out this number. Um, I was wondering that, is it possible to drill a few, maybe six to 10 relatively cheap boreholes, four or 500 meters deep and, and stick in a DAS cable so that that we, how to say, instead of having, uh, you know, only surface arrays as, as discussed before, this gives us a limited view, we collect as much as possible, relatively cheap data, but still a depth. Right, so not very sophisticated, very expensive one or two boreholes, but just an array of many relatively cheap and well instrumented boreholes with us. Question is, what would get us this kind of instrumentation? Yeah, I, I certainly haven't done the numbers on what what the costs. I, I imagine the drilling is the really the ex, the most expensive aspect of all this, and so. Um, but if the holes remain very slim, it's actually not too expensive, okay. right? I, so I think, that's I think the key it's, point. It's not, it's not to get the core out and make sophisticated tons of geophysical experiments in these boreholes. It is really slim holes down to, Steve has his hands up, he, he knows the details, mm -hmm. slim holes um, just for sticking in simple instrumentation. So many simple observations, many simple instruments, but still in a borehole. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great idea. Steve, do you want to jump in? On? Yeah, I, I, I think putting, um, you know, shallower slant drilled holes across the fault zone, as long as the fault zone itself is well located and low constrained, is, it, is well constrained in space, that's a good idea. Um, but there, and, you know, back a little bit to what Yehuda was saying, there's, in terms of looking at the dynamics of earthquake rupture, which is the process we're talking about here, um, there are a lot of variables involved that only come into play at seismogenic depths and things such as fluid pressure and the dynamic weakening process. There are other things too that can be inferred from the surface, but the value of a deep drill hole or one or more deep drill holes is to calibrate that. Now, um, so this doesn't really rule out the shallow boreholes and their value. As long as they can be well constrained, they'll be of course much, much cheaper than a drill hole, but there are still, than a, than a deep drill hole, but there are still kinds of data you can obtain uniquely from a deep drill hole that bear on the preparation, the nucleation, the rupture propagation during an earthquake, the mineralogy, the composition of the fault zone, the fluid pressure, et cetera. And um, so I, I do think to be, honest about what we can obtain from the surface and shallow drill holes, we also have to acknowledge there's certain deep observations that are the only way to obtain some of these parameters and can test the models. And so I think that the models derived from shallower and surface-based observations can pose a very clean, testable series of hypotheses for deeper drilling. And I, I think, again, I think these are things that should be considered in toto. And yes, deep drilling is expensive, but a lot of money gets spent on a lot of things that have, left, have less value to society than this. Right, yeah. And um, so I do think we have to start thinking bigger again. And you know, I'm excited by this enthusiasm about this observatory because it puts us back to where we were almost 30 years ago when we were proposing deep drilling projects in the San Andreas. And the question was always, always where's the best place? How can you extrapolate away from multiple crossings from a deep drill hole? So the, I think these are things worth talking about in the context of this big project to think big and also to 
talk about what we can really resolve from the surface versus what we need to go in deep to actually measure directly. Okay. Great, thank you. So I just maybe I I have a question to Steve and and like do you envision just a single uh, deep uh, drill hole or do you envision an array because probably if we drill just once it it will miss many of the processes so that could happen anywhere on the fault. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, more holes is better, but you, as we learned with SafePod, even drilling through the fault at three kilometers, you learn things that you never would have imagined from the surface. We eliminated a number of hypotheses that have been floating around for decades, but it's a one spot on the fault. It's a creeping fault there. Uh, this would be potentially a locked fault producing big earthquakes. It would be very different. And one, and when we originally envisioned SafePod, uh, we actually had fault crossings off of one hole at one, three, six, and nine kilometers. So we had multiple depth sections. Again, a very ambitious project. I'm not trivializing how complicated this would be, but you know, we could obtain unique data from one one borehole that was then you know calibrated against the kind of work that we are discussing here from surface and shallow drilling. Um, more more drill holes are always better, but I think that's pretty unrealistic. You know, we have safe pod. We demonstrated we can accomplish a lot there. And another good step would be to go deeper and along a lock section, where we're trying to learn more at, at seismogenic, truly seismogenic depths, where big earthquakes nucleate and propagate and produce the most damaging radiation. Great, thanks. I think I think we're running we're running kind of short on time. I wanted to. Uh, make sure I reach out to some of the early career scientists that are in the group right now. I'm looking at this poll, and I, according to my calculations, we've got 52% of the people that are on the call um, self-defined as early career in some capacity. So do we have any questions from, um, from the audience, especially from the early career scientists? Don't be shy. This is a very friendly community. <laughs> It's the reason why they call it the community near fault observatory. Any questions? All right. Well, if we if we don't have any questions, I'll I'll pose one, and you guys can um, can jump on me. But I think I, we've talked a lot about um, the mostly seismic instrumentation, whether it's in boreholes or, you know, DAS. Um, but there's a whole aspect of this project that would involve um, other types of data sets that are not just seismometers, but could be um, GPS data, could be imagery data sets, could be thermal, could be, you know, stuff's related to understanding fluid processes. Does anyone have any like thoughts or suggestions or insight into like how those could be integrated in some capacity with kind of the, the seismic instrumentation that this audience might be most comfortable with? Do we have any experts on the, the geodetic or the imagery data sets or, you know, thermal measurements? So I think I think some of the some of the questions and some of the aspects of like Alice's models, for example, like really are fundamentally connected to things that are maybe best observed, you know, with those types of sensors. Like she she showed the importance of the constraining the fluid pressure on on some of the dynamic models, and I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of information about that from some of the seismic observations. And so I'm wondering if there's some ways we should try to brainstorm. So I'll, I'll just add a quick um, sort of suggestion I think I've brought up at a different uh, breakout session somewhere along the lines. Um, but um, to your aspect of, of getting more early career people involved as well, I think um, uh, having built into this community observatory um, some um, workshops and short courses and so on for for really targeting um, graduate students or, or other um, education levels where 
um, where cohorts could be built by um, people learning how to use these different data types, um, um, teaching each other how to use um, the different data types. Uh, I think that'll help sort of uh, bridge that th those boundaries between fields um, pretty well, especially starting with um, um, more early career uh, researchers. So just, just adding that, I think that should be part of this community observatory um, from the beginning. And maybe a, a question, because we have some experts in the audience. When when people were were formulating, you know, the Parkfield Observatory, was this is this some aspect of the early part of that that fell off, or was it just it wasn't the right time? Um, I'm wondering, like, what the relationship is between you know this type of educational and community development and being able to sustain the momentum, which I think, you know, David and others have pointed out, is going to be tricky for a large scale project. Well, perhaps I could comment on that a little bit. Um, so Parkfield was complicated in part because of the changing technology that was, was coming online at the time. We didn't have digital seismometers, for example. They were some of the first. So there was always the attempt to kind of stay at the cutting edge. Uh, strain meters would be another example. Um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm that put money up front. But as the years went by and the earthquake didn't happen, then people's interest began to drift elsewhere. And I think that's a that's a reality we have to face. Um, I, I agree with what Yehuda said that in the comment that you know think about a strategy that will allow this kind of project to grow with time is is really important and to look at new technologies as they come along uh, and figure out ways that they can be adapted and and uh, used to um, multiply the effort in in a in a long term study such as this one. Great, thanks. See, we're running pretty short on time. Does anyone have any closing thoughts, questions, comments? Well, I, I would like just to follow up on Bill's comment here about the growth aspect and, and tell a short story. Uh, I was a graduate student at Caltech in the late 2000s and had a chance to attend a couple of lectures by Kip Thorne who later got the Nobel Prize in Physics for the LIGO Observatory and Detection of Gravitational Waves. And at that time, the observatory didn't see anything, of course, right? And, and, and he was saying that we need to scale up the strain sensitivity by few orders of magnitude in order to be able to detect the waves. And, and at that time, it was actually funded for perhaps 20 years, right? And so it was on, like more than a decade later, when they first detected the gravitational wave. And, and I would say that we are in a worse uh, position in the earthquake community because at least they have an idea of what exactly the signal that they wanted to look for. But in our case, we also still the signal itself is not agreed upon. And, and as we probably get more data, we can discover more signals. So I think the sustainability and persistence and keep pushing on the different aspect because we heard a lot of ideas today which are all great like seismometers boreholes additional sensors or even talk with the engineering community about what types of new sensors that we can develop and use in order to detect the different aspects of the earthquake process but i definitely agree with with bill about the importance of uh, thinking long term and thinking about the growth strategy Great. Yeah, and I think um, I just want to remind people that we have a we have a Google Doc that if you have if something comes to mind that you want to post, um, you feel free to add your name and comment question. Um, and yeah, I think um, it's been a great session. I think we uh, <laughs> we could always use another hour, another two hours, but I think we'll have plenty of time over the next um you know a few months to keep discussing these questions and keep you know further developing the plan i think we heard a lot of really interesting science today and a lot of good ideas and food for thought to um further develop the um the plan so i think one thing is pretty clear is there's a lot of enthusiasm for this i think it's just a question of you know what exactly the details of what exactly we want to do but it's pretty clear we've got a strong community behind it so
All right. Well, thank you so much to Ahmed and, and Daniel for organizing, uh, to Alice and David for your presentations, and to everyone for your participation in this session. The recording will be made available on the Earth, Iris Earthquake Science Playlist. If you are interested in future community near fault observatory breakout sessions and other events, please check out the website in the link provided. And you'll notice actually we don't have future events planned yet, um, but we will post them there. But also, if you'd like to propose an additional breakout session or get more involved, uh, we do have an interest form um, on there as well. Uh, so thanks so much for joining and we'll end there.